Disclaimer, the following video is an accurate description of a disturbing crime in explicit detail. Please, if you are sensitive to disturbing content and or get easily triggered, please do not watch this. Thank you. Today we're going to be looking at another shocking child abuse case of Victoria Klimby. Now you may have heard of this case before. Uh, it's a shocking case about a young girl who was tortured and killed by her great aunt and her aunt's boyfriend. So I don't really want to waste any time um, because this video is going to be long as it is. Uh, we're probably looking at a half hour, 45 minute video here. So, um, you know, if you've got a spare half an hour, then I suggest sitting down with a drink or something and getting ready to listen because this is going to go on for quite a while. Victoria Adjo Klimby, born on the 2nd of November 1991, was a child who was tortured and murdered by her great aunt and her boyfriend. Her death led to a public inquiry and produced major changes in child protection policies in the United Kingdom. Born in Abobo, the Ivory Coast, Klimby left the country with her great aunt Marie Therese Cowell, a French citizen who later abused her for an education in France where they travelled before arriving in England, London, in April 1999. It is not known exactly when Kawao started abusing Klimby, although it is suspected to have worsened when Kawao and Klimby met and moved in with Carl Manning, who became Kawao's boyfriend. During the abuse, Klimby was burnt with cigarettes, tied up for periods of longer than 24 hours, and hit with bike chains, hammers and wires. Up to her death, the police and the social services department of four local authorities, the National Health Service, the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children and local churches all had contact with Crimby and noticed the signs of abuse. However, in what, in what the judge in the trial following Crimby's death described as blinding incompetence, all failed to properly investigate the case and the little action was taken. So what we're dealing with here is a classic story of a child being failed by the system and not being properly protected. So we're going to get onto the first bits of information here. This is about um, Klimby's early life um, and her move from France and subsequently the events that followed. On the 24th of April 1999, Kawao and Victoria Klimby left France and travelled to the United Kingdom, where they settled in Ealing, West London. They had a reservation in a bed and breakfast at Twyford Crescent, Acton, where they lived until the 1st of May 1999. When they moved to Nicole Road, Harlesden, in the London Borough of Brent, on the 25th of April 1999, Kawao and Klimby visited Esther Acker, a distant relative of Kawao by marriage, a midwife, counsellor and a preacher. Aka and her daughter noticed that, the Klim noticed that Klimby was wearing a wig and looked small and frail. On the 26th of April 1999, Kawao and Klimby visited the Homeless Persons Unit of Ealing Council, where they were seen by Julie Winter, a Homeless Persons Officer. Together, Kawao and Winter completed a housing application form, Kawao explained that Klimby was wearing a wig because she had short hair, an explanation which was accepted by Winter. Although Winter was shown Klimby's passport with a photograph of Anna, she paid no attention to them, believing that Kawao's application was ineligible on the grounds of habitual residence. Winter confirmed her decision with her duty senior and told Kawao that she was not eligible for housing. She telephoned the referral across to Pamela Fortune, a social worker in Ealing's Acton Referral and Assessment Team. She did not produce a written or electronic documentation of the referral. However, something which would have helped in double-checking the accounts that Kawao gave. Between the 26th of April and early June 1999, Kawao visited Ealing Social Services a whopping 18 times for housing and financial purposes. Klimby was with her on at least 10 different occasions. The staff there noticed that Klimby's unkempt appearance, with one staff member, Deborah Gaunt, thinking that she looked like a child from an action aid advertisement. 
However, they did not take any action and may have assumed that Klimby's appearance was a purposeful attempt to persuade the authorities to hand out money. On the 8th of June 1999, Cowell got a job at Northwick Park Hospital. During her first month, no effort was made by Cowell or Ealing Social Services to enrol Klimby in educational or daycare services. On the 8th of June 1999, Cowell took Klimby to a local GP. The practice nurse there did not carry out a physical examination as she was not reported to have had any current health problems. By the middle of June 1999, Klimby was spending the majority of her days at the Brent home of Priscilla Cameron, an unregistered childminder, who Cowell met at her job at the hospital. There is no evidence that Klimby was treated badly during her time with Cameron, although on several occasions Cameron observed small cuts to Klimby's fingers. When questioned by Cameron, Cowell said that they were caused by razor blades that Klimby played with. Cowell and Klimby met Aka on the street on or around the 14th of June 1999. In what may have been early signs of deliberate physical harm, Aka noted a scar on Klimby's cheek, which Cowell said was caused by a fall on the escalator. On the 17th of June 1999, in response to what she had seen three days earlier, Aka visited Cowell and Klimby's home and thought that the accommodation was unsuitable. On the 18th of June 1999, Acker anonymously telephoned Brent Social Services expressing concern over Klimby's situation. Samantha Hunt, the customer service officer who received the call at the one-stop shop at Brent House, faxed the referral to the Children's Social Work Department on that same day. Nobody picked up the referral on that Friday afternoon and what happened to it was, according to Lord Lamin, who headed the subsequent inquiry, the subject of some of the most bizarre and contradictory evidence the inquiry heard. A few days later, possibly on the 21st of June 1999, Acker phoned Brent Social Services again to make sure her concerns were being addressed. Acker said that she was told by the person on the other end of the telephone that probably they or in other words the social services had done something about it this call however did not trigger a new separate referral like it should have the first referral was not seen until three weeks later on the 6th of july 1999 when robert smith the group administrative officer logged the details of the referral onto the computer with details of klimby's injuries Lyman said the delay constituted a significant missed opportunity to protect Klimby. Edward Armstrong, the team's manager of the intake duty team, said that he completed a duty manager's action sheet not for the 18th of June, which he said never arrived in his office, but for the 21st of June referral, which was a less serious case than the first. Lyman called this version of events wholly unbelievable. Lyman said that Armstrong's evidence was out of line with that of the other Brent witnesses, that's the quality of it, left much to be desired. And that Armstrong's insistence that he dealt with the 21st of June referral was an attempt to cover up his team's inept handling of a genuine child protection case. So on the 14th of June 1999, Cowell and Klimby met Carl Manning, born on the 31st of October 1972, on a bus which he was driving. This was the start of Cowell and Manning's relationship, which ended at the time of their arrest eight months later. She was his first girlfriend. The relationship developed quickly and on the 6th of July 1999, Cowell and Klimby moved into Manning's one-bedroom flat at Somerset Gardens in Tottenham, in the London borough of Harringey. There is no evidence that Klimby's abuse increased soon after moving into Manning's flat. On the 7th of July 1999, Brent Brent Social Services sent a letter to Nicole Road, where Callow and Klimby were staying, informing them of a home visit. On the 14th of July 1999, two social workers, Laurie Hobbs and Monica Bridgman, visited the address but found no answer. Callow and Klimby had already moved out on the 6th of July 1999. Hobbs and Bridgman made no further inquiries at the property. These were inquiries that if they were made, might have led to a trail on Klimby's whereabouts. Prior to the visit, however, they had not done any background checks and had only the haziest idea of what they were investigating. 
The Lamming report suggests that no reports or follow-up notes were made and that the only information additional to the referral were the notes not at this address have moved. So what we're seeing here at the moment is a complete and utter lack of care from all of these different facilities, the social services, the NHS. Um, and like I said earlier, this is actually one of the cases that pushed the social services to be more to be more pushy with their investigations and actually, you know, kind of do a deep dive into them. Because that obviously, as you can see from the information I've just given you, um, they they weren't really interested. There was they didn't log it until a later date, until nearly a week later, it was actually reported. Um, and it just shows complete inept negligence, really. So we're going to get on to the next bit, which will be her first hospital admission. So this is the first time Klimby was talking to the hospital. On the 13th of July, 1999, Kawao took Klimby to the Cameron's house, asking her, to take Klimby permanently because Manning did not want her. Cameron refused but agreed to take her for the night. Cameron, her son Patrick and her daughter Avril observed that Klimby had numerous injuries including a burn on her face and a loose piece of skin hanging from her right eyelid which Kawao said was self-inflicted. Manning's account in the subsequent in inquiry differed and he said that he hit Klimby because of her incontinence, beginning with slaps but progressing to using his fist by the end of July. It was highly likely that at least some of the injuries was, were the result of deliberate physical harm. The next day on the 14th of July 1999, Cameron's daughter Avril took Klimby to see Marie Kada, a French teacher at her son's school. Kader advised that Klimby be taken to the hospital. At 11am on the same day, Avril took Klimby to the A&E department of Central Middlesex Hospital. At 11.50am, Klimby was seen by Dr Rhys Bennon, a senior house officer in the department. Bennon took Klimby's history from Avril and thought that there was a strong possibility that the injuries were not accidental. He referred the case to Dr Ekundayo Ajay Obi the on-call paediatrician register. Bainan conducted only a cursory examination of Klimby because he believed that she was going to be examined by the paediatrician's team. The Lamin report said that he exhibited sound judgment in his care of Victoria by referring her immediately to a paediatrician register. Klimby arrived at Barnaby Bear Ward, where she was examined by a Jab Obi, who was noted who noted various injuries when asked about the injuries Klimby said they were self-inflicted a claim the paediatrician did not think was credible a jeob's notes were detailed and thorough in contrast to those of other doctors that examined her having examined Klimby the paediatrician was strongly suspicious that the injuries were not accidental and she decided to admit Klimby onto the ward the doctors alerted Brent Police and Social Services and she was placed under police protection with a 72-hour protection order, preventing her from leaving hospital. Kawao told the doctors that she had scabies and that the injuries were self-inflicted. Many doctors and nurses suspected that the injuries were not accidental. However, Ruby Schwartz, the consultant paediatrician and named child protection doctor at the hospital, diagnosed scabies and decided that it was scratching that caused the injuries. She made the diagnosis without speaking to Klimby alone. Schwartz later admitted that she made a mistake. Another doctor, one of Schwartz's juniors, misleadingly wrote to social services saying that there was no child protection issue. When Michelle Hyen, a child protection officer at Brent Council, received a report notifying her of Klimby's injuries, she planned to open an investigation into the case. However, the next day she heard of Schwartz's diagnosis and downgraded Klimby's level of care, trusting Schwartz's judgment. She later expressed regret over her actions. Swartz said in the inquiry that she expected social services to follow up the case. Neil Quarnham, QC, counsel to the inquiry following Klimby's death, later said to her, There is a terrible danger here. Is there not? Doctor of social services on one hand and you on the other, each expecting the other to do the investigation, with the result that nobody does. 
The police officer allocated to Klimby's case for the Brent Child Protection Team, Rachel Dewa, decided to lift the police protection, allowing Klimby to return home. When told by a social worker that she had scabies under the Children Act 1989, Dewa was obliged to see Klimby and told her that she was under police protection. But she did not do this. She also failed to see Kawau or Manning at the time of the decision. Dewa was attending a seminar on child protection. Garnham later said, We will need to ask why it was thought more important for her to attend a seminar to learn how to deal with child protection cases than deal with the real child protection case for which she was responsible at the time. Kawau took Klimby home on the 15th of July 1999. Sometime in July, probably just before Klimby was admitted to the Central Middlesex Hospital, Kawau befriended a couple, Julian and Chantal Kimdeming. Klimby and Kawau visited their home several times over the following months. According to Chantal, Kawau would shout at Klimby all the time and never once showed her affection. So this is really shocking to read and to say to you guys because it's really just another case of a complete neglect. This child has been neglected. People around her are failing to realise this and doctors that have said, yeah, we do believe that her, uh, her injuries weren't accidental are being contradicted by other doctors saying, yeah, she had scabies, she was scratching her face, that's why there was, you know, skin hanging off her face and things like this. I just think it's completely unacceptable that this didn't this didn't go as far as it needed to. This should have been very deeply and thoroughly investigated, but it was kind of brushed over. And as you'll read later on, this actually did result in the death of Klimby, which is obviously a tragedy. Um, rest in peace, Klimby. Um, I would try and say her full name. I'll put it on screen now, but it's a bit much to say. Um, I'm, you know, I don't want to butcher her name just out of respect. So on the 24th of July, 1999, Klimby was taken by Kawau to the Accident and Emergency Service Department at North Middlesex Hospital with severe scalding to her head and other injuries. When the doctors gave a vivid description of Kawau telling off Klimby, Klimby immediately jumped out of bed and stood to attention. She was so frightened that she wet herself. The hospital found no evidence of scabies. Consultant Mary Rossiter felt Klimby was being abused but still wrote, able to be discharged on her notes. I'm sorry, if you feel a child is being abused, why are you putting that they're able to be discharged? You're sending them back to the place that they're getting abused? It, this doesn't make sense. It's just a complete lack of common sense. You wouldn't do that. You, it just wouldn't happen. According to Maureen Ann Meats, another doctor at the hospital, when Rossiter had written that note, she had noted that Klimby was exhibiting signs of neglect, emotional abuse and physical abuse. Later in the inquiry, Rossiter said that by writing able to discharge, she did not mean what she, she did not mean she wanted Klimby to go home, merely that she was physically fit to leave. Garnham said quite how the subtlety of that distinction was to be ascertained from the notes is far from obvious. Rossiter admitted to the inquiry that she had expected police and social services to follow up on the case. For a brief period while Klimby was in hospital hospital, Enfield Social Services took up the case before passing it to Harringy. A social worker and police officer from Harringy Council, Lisa Arthur Worry and Karen Jones, respectively, were assigned to her case and were scheduled to make a home visit on the 4th of August 1999. However, the visit was cancelled once they heard about the scabies. Jones later said, It might not be logical, but I did not know anything about scabies. She said that she telephoned North Middlesex Hospital for information about the disease, but Garnham had evidence that the staff there dealt with no such inquiry. Jones was told by a doctor that Klimby's injuries were consistent with belt buckle marks, although she claimed in the inquiry that there was no evidence of child abuse. 
on the 5th of August 1999, a Haringey social worker, Barry Almeida, took Klimby to an NSPCC centre in Tottenham, where she was assigned to Sylvia Henry. There was some confusion as to why the centre was being referred to for that case. Henry later contacted Almeida and was told, according to Henry, that Klimby had moved out of the borough, thereby closing the case. Almeida said that he could not remember whether this conversation did take place. On the same day, Cowell met Arthur Worry and Jones at the Harangy Social Services Department and claimed that Klimby had poured boiling water over herself to stop the itching caused by the scabies and that she had utensils to cause the other injuries. The social worker and police officer believed her, deciding that the injuries were probably accidental and allowed Klimby to return home for the following day, which she did. So this is now twice that she's been allowed to go home and come back two times repeatedly with severe injuries. How is are these not massive red flags? I'm sorry, but this doesn't make any sense to me. I'm reading it and even the, even the first time she got sent to hospital, any doctor who knows anything about anything knows what scabies looks like. Do you know what I mean? They they diagnose these sorts of things every single day, sometimes hundreds every single day. You would know what that looks like and what injuries are consistent with that diagnosis. But clearly she was just repeatedly swept under the rug. Either social services didn't want to deal with it or maybe there's something a bit more sinister here. So now we're getting on to the post-hospital events. So these would be events that have been documented to happen after hospital, after after she was discharged from the hospital. On the 7th of August 1999, Cowell visited Ealing Social Services. They said it was a housing issue and that the case was closed. Ealing Social Services would would later be described as chaotic. As a follow-up measure, a staff member at the hospital contacted a health visitor, but the health visitor said in the inquiry that she did not receive any contact. On the 13th of August 1999, Rossiter wrote to Petra Kitchman of Brent Council, asking her to follow up to the Klimby case. Kitchman said in the inquiry that she contacted Arthur Worry, but Arthur Worry denied this. Later on, the 2nd of September 1999, Rossiter sent a second letter. Kitchman said she spoke to Arthur Worry about this, but again, Arthur Worry vividly denies this. Arthur Worry made a visit to Klimby's home on the 16th of August 1999, and another one when Manning began forcing Klimby to sleep in the bathtub. Arthur Worry said in the inquiry that she was under the impression that Klimby seemed happy, but Garnham criticised Arthur Worry for not detecting any of the abuse, although Manning had described this visit as a put-up job. Arthur Worry and Klimby had met on four occasions, where they were together for a total of less than 30 minutes, barely speaking to each other. From then on, Cowell kept Klimby away from hospitals, turning instead to churches. Cowell said to pastors that she was the mother and that demons were inside Klimby. The pastor at the Mission Ensemble, Poor Christ, Pascal Arum, offered prayers for Klimby to cast out the devil and thought that her injuries were due to demonic possession. On another occasion, Cowell took Klimby to a church run by the Universal Church of the Kingdom of God, where the pastor, Alvaro Lima, suspected she was being abused, although he took no action. He said in the inquiry that Klimby told him that Satan had told her to burn herself, The pastor did not believe her, but he still believed that a person could be possessed. From October 1999 to January 2000, Manning forced Klimby to sleep in a bin liner in the bathtub in her own excrement. During a later police interview, Manning said that this was because of her frequent bedwetting at Haringey Social Services on the 1st of November 1999. Cowell told social workers that Manning sexually assaulted Klimby, but withdrew the accusation the following day. 
In one of Arthur Worry's visits, during a conversation about housing, Arthur Worry said that the council accommodated only children who were believed to be at serious risk. Liming said in his report, it may be no coincidence that within three days of this conference, conversation Cowell contacted Mr Arthur Worry to make allegations which if true would have placed Victoria squarely within that category. Jones sent a letter to Cowell which was ignored and further and no further action was taken. Manning later denied the allegation. Alan Hodges the police sergeant overseeing the investigation claimed in the inquiry that the social workers were obstructing the police in dealing with child protection cases but December 1999 sorry one second between December 1999 and January 2000 Arthur Worry made three visits to the flat but received no answer she speculated to her supervisor, Carol Baptiste, that they had returned to France, despite no evidence to support this claim. Her supervisor wrote on Klimby's file that they had left the area. On the 18th of February 2000, they wrote to Kawao saying that if they did not receive any contact from them, they would close the case. A week later, on the 25th of February 2000, they closed the case on the same day that Klimby died.